Hello sisters, it's so good to be with you today for this summer getaway. I hope you have enjoyed your day of rest so far. And so continuing with the same theme of rest, I will be sharing with you about what it means to rest in prayer. So first of all, my name is Rocio. It's very nice to meet you virtually. And I'm originally from the Dominican Republic, but raised in the US, New Jersey, and currently living in Berlin, Germany with my husband, Peter, as of eight or nine months ago. And I'm a student uh, in theology at the Augustine Institute and recently joined the Blessed Is She team um, as part of the devotional writers. So it's such a blessing to be with you and to be able to share with you about what it means to rest in prayer. And before I share with you about resting in prayer and uh, what I want to invite you to reflect on, I was thinking about a story that happened to me recently, not so long ago, about a moment that I rested physically and this physical rest allowed me to enter into a place of prayer that was needed, that I was avoiding and ultimately a place of rest. So some months ago, Peter told me, okay, I'm gonna set up the bath for you, clean it, put everything, candles around and everything so that you could have a bath. Now here in Germany, baths are like a big deal. Pretty much every apartment has a bathtub and it's like the best thing ever to be able to have a bath for Germans which for me, I think of that as such a special spa day, going with some friends for a bachelorette party or different things like this. So I'm still not on that bandwagon just yet. Um, however, every once in a while, I do enjoy it. So Pete set it all up and I said, okay, I'm gonna have my little spa day. And as I'm sitting there in the bathtub with candles all around me, super dim, uh, bathroom and some spa relaxing music in the background. I rested my head against the bathtub and just two minutes into listening to this kind of cheesy music, I started to cry. And I started to cry because in that moment, I realized that I was still grieving the death of a dear friend of mine in Ethiopia that happened a year ago. And in that moment, it was as if I just let it come. In that resting, I was met with this grief. And then in this safe space, in this quiet, in the solitude, I was able to bring it before the Lord and surrender that to him and give that over to him and rest in him. So today we're gonna talk about what, what it means to have a posture of rest in prayer. And I don't know about you, but maybe like me, you've been carrying some things on your heart. You've had some grief. You, you have some anxiety. You're nervous about some things. You have to make some big life decisions or some things are going on in your family and you're just kind of carrying that with you. Maybe you're holding back. Maybe you're nervous about uh, this new season of your life or maybe you want to be in control. And so the question that I want to ask you today and that I'm asking myself is, what kind of posture do I have before the Lord in prayer? Do I have a posture of rest or do I have one of anxiety? Do I have one of needing to grasp, of needing to have the wheel? Or am I open-handed? Am I trusting in the Lord? And so I want you to... Uh, I want to invite you to reflect with me about four aspects of prayer, resting in prayer. And of course, there are probably tons of things and you all could give me this talk, um, but I'm just trusting that the Holy Spirit is giving you this word as he gave it to me. So the four aspects of prayer that I want to share with you um, this day is resting in the identity of God, resting in our identity, resting in the mission in our mission, and resting in the communion of saints, which ooh, I'm very excited to talk about that. Um, but first and foremost, resting in the identity of God. 
before we can move on to anything else, before we can be uh, in this posture of rest before the Lord in prayer, we need to dig into this first point. We need to take a step back, take a moment to sit and ask ourselves, who is God? Do I know his character? Do I know his heart? Do I know his identity? So in order to do that, we're going to take a moment to read the Gospel of Luke, chapter 8, verses 22 to 25. Gospel of Luke, chapter 8, verses 22 to 25. I'll read it for you. One day he got into a boat with his disciples, and he said to them, Let us go across to the other side of the lake. So they set out, and as they sailed, he fell asleep. And a storm of wind came down on the lake, and they were filling with water and were in danger. And they went and woke him, saying, Master, Master, we are perishing. And he awoke and rebuked the wind and the raging waves, and they ceased, and there was a calm. He said to them, Where is your faith? And they were afraid, and they marveled, saying to one another, who then is this, that he commands even wind and water, and they obey him? So I love this story because, first of all, I can totally relate, and I think we understand the apostles because they're about to drown. The boat is taken on water. And uh, St. Luke even adds on there, they were in danger. So it's not like it was a perceived danger or they were actually okay and they just needed to take a chill pill. They were in danger. And yet they come to the Lord and the Lord, you know, calms down the sea and all these things. But then he asks them, where's your faith? Where's your faith? And I don't think it's so much because they came running to him, super nervous, saying, Lord, we're perishing. Um, I think it was because in this questioning, there was an implication. Lord, we're going to die. It wasn't with a confidence that, Lord, you can do something here. It was, we're freaking out. We're going to die. Everything's going under. Because they were not attentive in that moment to the identity of God revealed in the person of Jesus Christ the second person of the Trinity, which of course it was going to take a while for them to understand that. But you and I are blessed that we can read the Gospels now and know that this is a revelation of the character of God, of who God is. And so we see revealed here in this moment and what occurs and what Jesus does. We, uh, of course, can maybe look at many facets, but we're going to focus on three things that we can know about the character of God from this story. That God is trustworthy, that God is caring, and that God is sovereign that God is trustworthy, that he is caring, and that he is sovereign. Trustworthy because, first of all, the apostles went to him with this great need, and he was able to deliver. He was able to calm down the seas, put everything back in its place, because God is trustworthy. We can entrust to him things that are hard, that are difficult, that seem impossible, and we can trust that he will take care of it, that he's got it, that he can handle it that he can handle our anger, that he can angle our confusion, that he can handle, excuse me, our confusion, that he can handle our, uh, the craziness and the state of the world at the moment. He can handle it. He's trustworthy. And that he keeps his promises. We can see that the Lord is caring um, because he doesn't just dismiss what they're going through. He actually tends to their needs. He recognizes it and accepts it, even though he challenges them. But he cares for them. And that's why it's so beautiful in the first letter of St. Peter, chapter 5, verse 7. St. Peter says, cast your cares upon the Lord because he cares for you. Cast your cares upon him because he cares for you. So the Lord is trustworthy. He's caring. And the Lord is sovereign. And we see this with the last question that everybody's asking. Who is this that even the seas and the winds obey him? Even though there's a storm, even though it's mayhem, the Lord is sovereign. He was able to just get up from his sleep and do this thing. And he probably went right back to sleep. Um, and the Lord is able to do this in my life and in your life. Even when we see the difficult things going on, even when things seem crazy, we need to take a step back and remember who is God? 
he is trustworthy, he's caring, and he is sovereign over my life. There's nothing that happens, nothing that escapes his notice. So allowing um, ourselves to be informed more and more about the identity of God, who he is, allows us to step in more deeply to our identity and, and who we are. So first of all, we're God's handiwork, right? We're his creation. But most especially through baptism, you and I have been adopted into God's family. So we are his children. And since all of you are ladies, we are his daughters. And what does that mean? St. Paul tells us that this means that we have received the Holy Spirit through whom we can call out Abba, Father. And Abba actually doesn't translate to Father, as I'm sure many of you know. It's Daddy. That the Holy Spirit in us through baptism allows us to pray in this way, Daddy, to God. And so praying from our identity as children of God Resting in this identity in prayer allows us to pray with authority, with trust, and with surrender. So resting in our identity when we pray allows us to pray with this authority, this trust, and this surrender. And um, I was just reading over chapter uh, 10 of Luke when the 70 disciples who were sent out by Jesus came back and they said to the Lord, Lord, the demons are subject to us. They came back super excited. Lord, the demons are subject to us. Through their prayer, praying in authority, the demons were subject to them. And you and I, as children of God through baptism, get to share in this authority when we pray. We get to give everything over to the Lord and trust in him as children of God. We know um, that St. Paul reminds us in Romans 8, 28, all things work together for good. All things work together for good. So when we rest in prayer, when we remember our identity, that we are God's children, that he's a good father, we can trust. We can hand everything over to him. We can pray in a way that is confident and in a way that is surrendered. That at the end of the day, I know that God has my best interest in mind and that I can give that over to him. And it sounds very cheesy, but then many of us, I'm sure, have had the experience where we look back and we had prayed for X, Y, or Z and we wanted it to happen and then it didn't happen. And then only sometime later could we look back and realize, whoa, I'm so glad that did not happen. So we can pray with this surrender when we rest in our identity, when we come before the Lord remembering who he is and who we are. And uh, here I just wanted to say something because when I talk about praying in boldness, right, as the children of God or praying with trust and surrender, I just want to make a distinction that we're, we're not entitled little brats. Um, it's not like, Whatever I demand from the Lord, he needs to give it to me because mine, 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 because I say so. But we are called to put everything under the sovereignty of God, to hand everything back, to learn to pray as Jesus prayed in the Garden of Gethsemane. Lord, I want X. Father, I want Z. But not my will. Your will be done. This is what it means to pray with authority, to pray with trust, and to pray with surrender. To ultimately place everything in these beautiful hands of God and trust and reverence his sovereignty over our lives. So when we come before the Lord, remembering who he is and remembering who we are, we can rest in this prayer. In this time of prayer before the Lord, we can rest because we know who he is. We know who we are and what belongs to us through our identity. Next, I wanna talk about um, being able to rest in our mission and how that allows us to rest uh, in prayer before the Lord. So the reason why I wanted to touch on this is because many times we're running around trying to please the Lord, trying to do ministry, trying to serve, trying to figure out what the next step is, what we should do, and we get so caught up in the doing, 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 doing. And we think, I need to, you know, do 10,000 rosaries and I need to do this and I need to go um, 
pray outside of the abortion clinic every day. And all these things are great. But we have to take a step back. And that's what I'm inviting you to do today. And remember our mission. What is our mission? More than all of these exterior things that we can do, that we can add on to our resumes, our deepest mission and call is to eternal union with God in heaven, beginning here on earth. And to make God known and loved through our lives, through our witness. This is the core, the essence of our mission. So whether it's lived out through the vocation of motherhood, whether it's lived out through the vocation of a religious sister, whether you're still trying to figure out what is my vocation, whether you're patiently or not so patiently waiting for your future spouse, whatever situation you're in, if you're at a crossroads, if you're um, just really confused and not sure, it can uh, bring a lot of anxiety in prayer and a lot of anxiousness. And we want to have control and we want to know what's going on. So sometimes our prayer does not look like resting in the Lord when we're trying to figure out our vocation or, uh, or big decisions that we need to make. And I just want to invite you and encourage you, um, because I need to do this daily, to take a step back and remember, what is my mission? What is my mission? And I can rest there. That my mission, more than all of these things that I need to do or need to get done or think I need to do, my mission is to be united with God eternally in heaven, beginning now, and make him known and loved. This is the core and the essence of my mission. And this begins in the small things. And of course, it's in the big things, but it begins in the small things. So I can take a step back and rest in this sense, in this truth, that this is the deepest mission that I have even as I'm trying to figure out all these other things. This is the essence of my call. And so when I come before the Lord in prayer, I can rest in this and knowing that this is my mission, that this at least I don't have to figure out. So resting in God's identity, resting in our identity, resting in our mission. And lastly, I want to talk with you about resting in the communion of saints. And I know we probably all go to mass. And so at least once a week on Sundays, we make this bold statement. I believe in the communion of saints. I believe in the communion of saints. And the question is, do we really? Uh, I was a missionary in Ethiopia for almost two years. And there I had the privilege and the gift and the honor of befriending many Protestant brothers and sisters uh, from all over the world. And I would pray with them. We would, you know, intercede for the country together. We would do praise and worship together. We would live life together. And it was very beautiful. And I remember one day uh, having a conversation with one of these Protestant brothers of mine. And normally, you know, super respectful uh, about my Catholic faith, always a bit curious. And so we would always have conversations. And one of the big things for him that he couldn't get over is why we as Catholics believe in the saints and why we believe that they can intercede for us. And I shared with him, for me, it just makes perfect sense. If we believe that those who die in the Lord are with him now in heaven, and we would ask them for prayer here on earth, why can't we ask them for prayer when they're in heaven if we believe that they are alive and in the presence of God? They're much closer to him now than they were when they were here on earth. But of course, he didn't believe me and was not convinced, but more and more, I am convinced of this truth that we can trust, that we can rest in the communion of saints, that if we have things that we are anxious about, that we are confused about, that we think, Lord, how is this situation gonna, you know, get undone or gonna be fixed? I have no idea. And I need some backup prayer for this. We can come to the saints and ask for their intercession and ask them to pray before the throne of God for this thing. And we can trust that the Lord hears them because they are so, so, so much in the heart of God in heaven. And so I want to um, share with you just a, a story actually about this friend that I mentioned at the beginning of, of my talk uh, who passed away over a year ago now in Ethiopia. And before he passed away, a week before, we got a call to pray, to pray, to pray, to pray, so that he would be healed. Uh, he had experienced a, 
a very big car accident, leaving him in a coma. So we were asked to pray people all over the world uh, for his total and complete healing. And so we were praying and praying and all of these Protestant brothers and sisters were praying. And I had my sister and some friends um, in on this and praying with me um, through the intercession of Pierre Giorgio Frassati, who I'm sure many of you know. And so we were praying, we were offering novena, a novena for him. And some days before he passed away, one of the uh, Protestant friends wrote a message in this big chat that we had going on, interceding for him. And he said, I had a dream last night about Caleb. And in my dream, a doctor named Peter came to him and was treating him and mending his wounds and making everything better. A doctor named Peter. And in that moment, when I read that message, I just felt such confirmation that Pierre Giorgio Frassati, Pierre uh, in French means Peter in English, even though he was Italian. Um, and in that moment, I just felt that he was really interceding for Caleb and was present somehow. And the interesting thing is that although Caleb did not receive total healing, in fact, he went on to pass some days after that message, there was such peace and confidence that he had gone to be with the Lord. And so this uh, intercession of Pier Giorgio Frassati was not according to what I thought and expected for his physical healing, but Pier Giorgio was pro probably preparing his soul and helping him to prepare to meet the Lord. And uh, just so many correlations because Pier Giorgio died at 24. My friend was very young, only 30 years old and both on fire for the, for the Lord. So for me, this experience of um, having this confirmation that Pierre Giorgio was in fact interceding and helping my friend Caleb, even though it did not end the way that I wanted it to end, I saw the power of God through this communion of the saints, that they, before the throne of God, can see all things much better than we can. And so I want to invite you, sisters, um, to think about one particular thing that you are struggling with or that's very heavy on your heart or that one friend that just does not believe or this one family member that has caused you so much pain or that you need to forgive, whatever it is, I want to ask you to just think about that one thing. And now think about one saint that you can ask to intercede intensely for this petition. And maybe if you don't know a saint, might I suggest St. Joseph in this year of St. Joseph? Or you can just Google patron saint of, and I'm sure something will come up. And, and I invite you to entrust that intention to this saint and pray a novena um, for this intention or offer something tangibly, uh, a prayer on a daily basis maybe for the intercession of this saint, for this intention. And I believe that you're going to see how true and how beautiful this communion that we have with the saints truly is. And so I invite you, sisters, as we are enjoying this summer getaway, to really, really, really enter into a season which should be in every moment of our lives, into a season of resting in prayer. And so this season should be today, tomorrow, yesterday, um, that we rest before the Lord when we come to pray, that we don't just come to take it off uh, our checklist of things to do because we're always on the go, because we have so many things to do and I just need to pray to get it off my list. No, let's come before the Lord with a different posture. Let's come before the Lord with a posture of rest, that we are resting and remembering who he is who we are, what our mission is, and that we can trust in the communion of saints. And so I invite you sisters to reflect on this. I encourage you to take this to heart. And I, if I could give you two tips um, when you pray, maybe this week you could put it into practice. Um, the first thing is remembrance. And the second thing is gratitude. When we pray, let us remember, let us bring before our mind what the Lord has done who he is. Let us remind ourselves of the truth of who we are, not the lies, but who we are. 
Let us remember our mission. What is the essence of our life? More than all these other things we have going on. And let us remember that the saints are with us, that they're for us, that they're praying for us and so willing to do so. And let us come before the Lord in gratitude, giving thanks for everything that he's done, for what he's going to do. And as we remember and as we give thanks, we are able to just rest before the Lord. We're able, able to give everything over to him. And so I invite you, my dear sisters, to join me in doing that. Um, during this time, maybe take a, a moment of your day to put that into practice. And I will as well. And so I just want to thank you for your time with me today. And I pray blessing over you that the Lord would let his face shine upon you and give you his peace. God bless you.